As Putin's war in Ukraine rages on, there's one terrifying question hanging over Eastern Europe. How far will he go? In Ukraine, NATO's hands are tied, but what if Putin chooses to march on to the Baltic states, to Poland, Slovakia, Romania or Hungary? There are worrying signs that Russia's leader might be willing to take the ultimate gamble and risk a direct confrontation with NATO. So on another special edition of To The Point, we ask Putin's war, is he really threatening Eastern Europe? Welcome to To The Point, and here are my guests today. Daria Suchachuk, a Russian journalist based in Berlin, working for Ostwest TV. And Karolina Vigura, a sociologist and journalist from Poland, also a fellow at Kultura Liberna Foundation in Warsaw and Robert Bosch Academy here in Berlin. And Milan Nitsch from Slovakia, senior fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations. A warm welcome to all of you. So this war has already had a profound effect on uh, Eastern European countries in many, many ways. Karolina, you've just returned from uh, Poland uh, yesterday, I believe. Uh, tell me about what, what you felt there and what's, what the mood is like. So I felt immense uh, amount of fear and at the same time immense uh, amount of empathy. So you have fear because if you ask whether... Eastern Europe will be attacked by Putin, well, vast part of the Eastern Europe already thinks, yes, we are already at war. So there is this fear which is connected with our geography and also uh, with the historical uh, experience of the region that tells us if Ukraine is uh, on fire, then we are going to be on fire mm. very soon. You have written in an article about the re-traumatization of Eastern Europe by this war. What do you mean? We mean that we basically think in Poland that we see in Ukraine both our past and our future. We see the past because we see the dormant imperialism of Russia coming back again and again throughout the last 300 years, but it could be also potentially future. This is why people already are feeling a lot of fear, although they fight with this fear with empathy, with empathy towards the refugees. Emilan, uh Compared to the population, Slovakia at the moment takes uh, uh, the largest share of refugees. Uh, well, if you don't count Moldova, a uh, country of two and a half million that uh, has the same amount of refugees mm. as my, my home country, Slovakia, um, 200,000 uh, now and growing. But uh, I wouldn't single out any country because this is now, mm. as the uh, UN Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, said, the fastest growing refugee crisis mm. in Europe since Second World War. So more than the Bosnian War or more than wars in former Yugoslavia that had smaller number and, and started gradually. This, this is unprecedented mm. in the pace of when this war was by surprise started on the what is now two weeks ago. Yeah. And now we have two million people on the move. And this is before the shelling of Kiev really started. There will be more, there will be millions of more in the coming days or weeks, I'm afraid. Uh, Refugees uh, alike, which already uh, aside, which already uh, uh, affect uh, the the countries that, that take take them in. But with respect, uh, with regard to what Karolina just said, uh, what's the mood like in Slovakia? Is it similar to the mood in Poland? Karolina described it very well. I'm not there. Uh, I am here, although on the phone uh, and through social media with my friends and family. I think there is a profound confusion. There is fear. There is also empathy. There is now uh, a big wish to help. Uh, Ukrainians that are that are that are escaping, um, also to to do the right thing. Unlike in 2015, I think a lot of people, a lot of my friends, really want to be on the border to to help. I don't know how the capacities they will cope. So I brought to the studio um, a leaflet that is that is distributed also in Ukrainian mm. at the border uh, with Slovakia at Vishna um informing Ukrainians about their rights. Uh, that are provided now, they have temporary protection. This is unprecedented, this is fast, but will, will it, how long will it last if you have only a limited number of beds, limited number of uh, immediate facilities? So in a way, I feel strange sitting here in the studio and not being there uh, as a volunteer on the border. Because we see them as, you know, we feel tremendous solidarity 
with Ukrainians. They are not part of the EU, but they are people like us, mm. a part of Europe, and uh, they, are, they are attacked. And I have to say also with Daria in the studio, I feel tremendous solidarity with Russians mm. that are not behind this, that are not supporting Putin, because this is also a domestic war on on Russians mm. by the Kremlin. It's interesting that, that you mentioned that, Daria, um, you are Russian, you're a journalist, yeah. you're based in Berlin, and earlier, uh, as we spoke, you told me that you're now a criminal. Yeah, I am. I'm a criminal facing, in the worst case, up to 20 years in jail for uh, donating to Ukrainian humanitarian relief, among other things, while being a Russian citizen. That constitutes the criminal offense of treason. I have committed a number of other crimes, including <laughs> joining a protest against the war and spreading the so-called fakes, uh, aka truth about the war in Ukraine, which is now also a criminal offense from which journalists especially are suffering in Russia. And Two days ago, I have seen a count on one of the very few independent journalistic projects left uh, in Russia that at least 150 journalists have left Russia already since the beginning of the war. But obviously, this number can be a lot higher because many of those people are not really properly counted. There is no official register of journalists and how many of them are leaving or not. But this is what the people from uh, that uh, project managed to count on social media because obviously not all the journalists announced that they're leaving on social media. Uh, quite many just let their friends know. But it is physically dangerous to be a journalist in Russia now and call war war and not the special operation as the official term demands. Mm, so you're not my, just a migrant anymore, you're an exile, an official exile. Are you still in touch with your friends and family in Russia? And tell us about the civil society in Russia. Uh, how is this war being viewed there? Uh, I am in touch with my uh, friends and family in Russia. Some have also left. The thing is that obviously leaving Russia is not an easy feat because unless you have... I am a very privileged person because I have my permanent residence in Germany, I have my work visa, I am allowed to work and live here. No one's going to kick me out of here unless I commit some <laughs> crimes here in Germany and become a true career seasoned criminal. But um, the thing is that you need a work visa to enter Germany or a study visa or anything like that. And a lot of, gen of Russians don't have it. So many have left to the neighboring countries which have visa-free regime with Russia, like Kazakhstan, uh, Turkey, partly. Some people are in Egypt. Also, of course, countries in the Caucasus, like Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, Central Asia, uh, even the countries like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, which were previously viewed as very undesirable places to live in. Right now, they are seeing a massive influx of Russian citizens who are uh, going there, some are saying, well, we'll wait it out, we'll mm. try to do our jobs, we'll see what we can do right now, uh, and we'll maybe we'll look for jobs somewhere else. But for now, we just want to be out of harm's way, just to make sure that we're not going to be detained tomorrow for anything, I don't know, for wearing a badge saying no to war mm. or something. This is also an offense. Uh, so... Civil society. All these countries uh, uh, are affected, Russia uh, included. Um, what about uh, support, the support you, that you feel that you will be getting in that role as frontline states from the West, from NATO? What do, you, what, what do Slovakians feel? Well, um, if we put aside your original question at the beginning of this program about... Uh, security. The immediate, uh, I think there are two, three issues that uh, affect the current situation these days, these weeks. One is the uh, humanitarian help with the flux of refugees. Many of them just go through these countries, but a lot of them stay. In Poland, there are two million Ukrainians, so they have friends and families. Prague is a city running on Ukrainians. Uh, Budapest, my friends, they are, in spite of the pro Russian policy of the Orban government, is full of Ukrainians, so there is immediate relief and material help, more than demands for redistribution of these refugees, because many of them will go to their families on the other side of Europe. Second is uh, the direct impact of uh, sanctions on Russia, especially if it will go to oil and gas, will be felt in, in these countries of Central and Eastern Europe. They are much more vulnerable uh, because of their energy mix, because of higher um, percentage, up to 100% in Hungary, of Russian gas. And the third is uh, Russian disinformation, which is fed by 
by uh, various alternative media, uh, very active Russian embassies there, and you simply have a match of part of the political spectrum, which is uh, which is far right or or extremist and full of resentment, and they click with part of the population, mm. and now fed with uh, some narratives that are very anti-Western um, and somehow not ag against um, Ukraine. 90% of Slovaks is uh, really thinking that, uh, that Russia uh, did an unprovoked aggression on mm. Ukraine, so it's difficult to go against the wind. But you have, you have poking into the whole democratic structure of, of these uh, countries and societies from various ways, and this is long term, this is not only happening now, so the, the vulnerabilities that are there are not only about this week, but longer term. And I would, I would end up by saying that also this country, Germany, is sending its soldiers, I think 700 uh, to Slovakia as part of fo uh, uh, forward present at the uh, eastern flank of uh, NATO members uh, at the borders of um, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia and Belarus. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, on the Polish side, uh, we have seen this week that Poland offered to send fighter jets in a bit of a strange move via Germany, via a US base in, in, in Germany, and to be transferred uh, to Ukraine. But the US has said it doesn't want it. Does Poland still feel supported by the US? So there are two things that we have to mention. First is pacts. And of course, NATO is a pact in which every member should feel safe because of the Article 5. And it's extremely important that we remember that. But on the other hand, this war is a war on emotions and disintegration and disinformation. Uh, so you have the pact and you have on one side and the, the other side is the history of being, uh, being always in the region that is ever again attacked by the Imperial Russia. There is this old saying in Eastern and Central Europe, they are going to abandon us again. So you have, you have this, and of course you have the Russian disinformation. I think there is a lot, by the way, to learn from 2015, mm. indeed. Because you, we, we see now tremendous empathy in, in our lands. You mentioned two uh, million of Ukrainians in Poland. Already three and a half, because already 1.5 million arrived we, within the last two weeks. So, so we have a tremendous help and empathy. But the, the, the disinformation of Russia will be not dormant. They will work. And I think they will work on divisions in society, on radicalizing the, the, the far right, in order to, to make this whole picture not as pretty as it is now. You just mentioned something very interesting. Uh, they will abandon us again. And uh, I believe we have a um, soundbite prepared from uh, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, with regard to that. Let's uh, uh, listen into that if we can. We will defend every inch of NATO territory against aggression coming from anywhere at any time. Our commitment to Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all, is ironclad. The President has called it sacrosanct. And no one, no one should have any doubt about that. So a big promise uh, there from Antony Blinken. Uh, do you feel much safer now after this? Yes, I do, and not only after this. Uh, um, I understand Polish sentiment from history because they were abandoned several times. Po Poland didn't exist on the map for 200 years. It was partitioned among uh, Austria, Russia, Prussia. In Slovakia, in my country, the feeling is different. Um, we are not so much... We, we didn't feel before the war to be so much exposed as a neighbor of Ukraine. It's still this not, war is not over. It's something else to have a um, Russian military sitting at the border with uh, my country, Hungary, and so on, and threatening, and something else if it's poked down in Ukraine. Uh, and I think Ukraine uh, is now fighting a fight for all Central Eastern Europe, for EU as well, for the EU, because um, as members of NATO and the EU, if Poland or Slovakia is attacked, everybody is attacked, Germany is in war. So the whole thing about, uh, about uh, fighter jets that you mentioned is very sensitive, extremely sensitive also from Polish side. It's a very complicated issue also uh, in terms of how 
you can you can deploy it effective in this communication system of, of these jets but also uh, from where they will they will go because uh, Moscow is threatening any country any neighboring country including Romania. I mean, most lately, two days ago, the Russian Ministry of Defense said that they have reliable information that Ukrainian fighter jets are landing on Ukrainian airports, and Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian, sorry, Romanian air bases, and this can potentially be viewed as Romania joining the war. And this is a very open threat from Russia. They haven't seen; they are already seeing it as a threat, but they're hinting at it. Very right. So you have That's a very, right. very fine line, very, very timid, very delicate line to. To, to navigate here at the same time when rockets are fired to Ukrainian airfields, even from Transnistria, so from another country which is not part of the war, the occupied Transnistria in Moldova that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all paradoxes is happening, it's full of paradoxes happening very fast. It's history in the making. Mm. But I want to underline that um, I think there is a big division between countries in Central Eastern Europe that are members of NATO and EU and those who are not, and I feel I, 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 I really, if I were Moldovan or Georgian, I would be extremely worried now, yeah. and I would very much hope that the that the the whole battleground, that the the, the fighting is mm -hmm. is only concentrated in Ukraine. Mm. I think it's very important what you are saying because it's about where this is heading next, right? So we yes. have seen the logic of of Putin's behavior is clear. It started with Chechnya, he went to Georgia, he went to Donbass, and now he's in Ukraine. So he has to go further. It's, it's, it's logical. Would you agree? But, but uh, let me just mention the Baltic states, because the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya, Kaya Kallas, she was reminding it very many times that the Estonians already feel threatened, even though they are a NATO member country. Would you agree? Is, is, explain Putin to us. You're, you're the Russian <laughs> at the table. I know it's a, I know it's a, a bit of an ask, but uh, is he? Would you? Could he be willing to confront NATO? That is a good question because I don't think there is a person in the world left who could explain what Putin thinks because his brain is not only a black box, it's a black box with an intransparent tube because not only do we not know how he thinks and what he thinks, we also don't know what kind of information he's getting. So since we cannot see the input, we cannot possibly predict the output of his thinking. However, I do think that he's thinking in this very expansionist logic, this very post-imperial. He seems to have mentally being in about 1856 right now. And uh, I do think Moldova might potentially, or Georgia. Armenia, by the way, let's not forget Armenia and Azerbaijan, where there is already the Russian forces controlling the Karabakh. Uh, the disputed territory between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There is a big Russian military presence in Caucasus anyway, and Putin has already attacked Georgia in 2008. So um, it's kind of a well-trodden path for him already mm -hmm. by now. If I may, uh, however, in the, in the North Karabakh, you have Turkey directly involved. So yeah. Russia that played against this, uh, this deal with Turkey. But um, coming back to what Vladimir Putin actually said or wrote, there is an essay authored by him on Ukraine yes. uh, back in July last year. We should come back to reread it. Um, on Ukraine is almost like Mein Kampf from the Kremlin. Exactly. Yeah. And it's about Ukraine. And the, by, by mistake, I think some Russian media published also uh, after the war, one day after the war, yes. uh, with this, this, this statement that was maybe prepared after a fast defeat of Ukraine, <laughs> which stated that Russia, Belarus and Ukraine are together again to form a sort of a post-Soviet Slavic core. And I think it's important for people to go back to maps and history and see where the Soviet Union you know, ended. So the Baltic countries that you mentioned, they're small, they're part of NATO and the EU, but they were part of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. I think by now Kremlin draw the line. They understand that it's a different game there, but everything from post-Soviet, from former Soviet Union that is not in NATO and EU, is to be, is to I think be. they want to be consulted about their future, their future, uh, uh, not only uh, military uh, sort of and security arrangements, but also trade arrangements. It all started in Ukraine with the EU association agreement back before 2014, not with the uh, future of NATO. I think that's just a pretext. So mm. let me make this point that this is also about values. I said previously that it, this is about pacts and this is all 
already very important pact uh, soon servanda right mm -hmm. but uh, values are very important here because if you look at those central and eastern european countries that are either nato nato members or not they they share a kind of a nervous sense of their selves this is because they have been losing sovereignty many many times in their history and regaining and so those those fears are about two logics of international order. Either we think in the, uh, in the categories of spheres of influence, and then we can agree with Mr. Putin. We can say, of course, the big um, countries can decide what the small countries are doing. But if we believe in values like democracy and the rule of law, then we also believe in self-determination of a given nation. This is what the Ukrainians are fighting for, right? Okay. They are fighting for the fact that they have been westernizing this society for 30 years, and now they would like to have the fruit. So, so I, I do understand that, that, that there is this pact, and I, I completely believe Mr. Blinken. But on the other side, there are also emotions and motivations in politics and international order. So many, many nations, when they observe what is happening today in Ukraine, they say, well, this society would like to have democracy and see what happens, and the West is what? Mm. Sending some arms, perhaps. Isn't it too, too little? This is the biggest question of today. I think it goes down to whether you can be independent in the sphere of influence of one uh, country that is uh, trying to claim it's mm. uh, more than sphere of influence. It's, it's sphere where it decides or mm -hmm. co-decides with these small countries. And Moscow, uh, the current leadership of Russia, has not accepted the existence of small uh, nations, small right. countries, that mm. they have the right. right to go where they want. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, would like to, before we continue on this, I, uh, I would like to sort of take one step further uh, and go um, to the point where what happens after this? Let's assume this crisis is resolved in one way or another. Um, Carolina, you wrote in this war that the, this war could reinforce the region's turn towards nationalism. Mm. Mm. Um, just talk a bit more about that. Fear is not a good advisor. And even though I, I do believe that the Poland's way of democratic transformation after 1989 was the best possible uh, that we can choose, uh, in, in, in those situations when there are fears about the, the, the future, even populist uh, governments can gain mm. uh, popularity, regain popularity, because war usually brings more popularity to a given government, even if it's, if it's, if it's a populist. One question, though, that I find very important as well, and I might direct that to Daria, what can Russia do if this crisis is resolved one way or another? What can, how long will it take for Russia to return from international pariah, which it is right now, to become a partner for in, in the international order? Well, I think there are many factors influencing this, and not the least of them is the energy prices. Obviously, if the world is in a very dire need of oil and gas, this is good for Russia. Uh, the question is how much, uh, because we can see Europe and US and UK trying to get off this needle, but we don't know how long it will take. Mm. We honestly cannot, especially Eastern European countries, we just didn't have the time yet to adapt to the new reality of the 21st century. Uh, in terms of an international pariah, I think it depends on how long Putin will remain in power, and I don't think anybody can really predict that. I have experienced horrible disappointment because until very lately, I have been hoping that there is a possibility of some kind of peaceful transition that Putin might want to strike some kind of balance with the civil society and say, hey guys, you could have your little independent media, your Echo Moskvi and your TV Rain, the TV channel and the radio station that were closed, by the way, on one day, on the same mm. day, um, about a week ago, uh, if I am not mistaken. Ten days later, in the first days of war, for exactly that, for covering mm. the war as it is. Uh, but we see that he's turning into the good old-fashioned 20th century dictator, who is probably going to, to quote Mr. Lukashenko, uh, cling on to power until his fingers turn blue. Um, and um, we don't know how long this will take, and I cannot see the Western countries signing some kind of trade agreements with Putin again. Now he's so absolutely and completely discredited, and we all know by now that signing anything 
with the Russian government assigning it with Putin, essentially. Mm. He's the sole ruler of it. One last question, very briefly, please. Can the West, can NATO return to business as usual if this crisis is resolved? Briefly. If you it can. will be different NATO. Uh, and on Russia and Ukraine, I think the biggest question here is what will be their relations in the future, the country of 150 million and country of 40 million, the two largest countries in the East. Think about on a good, in a good way, Serbia and Croatia after their war, but on a much larger scale. I'm afraid we have to leave it here. Many, many open questions. Uh, we'd love to go on, uh, but we have to leave it right here. I'd like to thank my guests and uh, thank you all uh, for watching To The Point. <laughs>